It's crazy. I mean, you know, to go from zero to, you know, 25 million in sales. And I mean, that's just, that's just, yeah, you know, there's publicly traded companies that don't do that much in revenue. It's not possible. John and I are yin and yang in the last 11 years. If we're not on the road, building this thing, building the culture, building the teams, right? Having the tough discussions, right? Having the no ego, like, you know, it might be tough for us to swallow when things have to change, but at the end of the day, like, it's the best thing for our company. Let's discover what people are building in the greater Cleveland community. We are telling the stories of Northeast Ohio's entrepreneurs, builders, and those supporting them. Welcome to the Lay of the Land podcast, where we are exploring what people are building in Cleveland and throughout Northeast Ohio. I am your host, Jeffrey Stern, and today I had the real pleasure of speaking with Aaron Hoffman and John Zeno, co-founders of Deliver That, based in Canton, Ohio. Friends for Life, the two of them started this business out of Ohio University in 2016 off the bat of a viral tweet and have since proceeded to revolutionize the catering delivery industry with over $300 million of catering delivery under their belt, a network of over 25,000 active drivers on their platform, operational in all major cities in all 50 states, helping over 500 brands elevate their catering experience. This is an awesome story of entrepreneurship, constant learnings, and overcoming adversity along the way. We covered the evolution of Delivery That's business model to set the standard for catering delivery and setup, profitable growth and cash flow positivity, recapitalizations, personally developing as leaders, mistakes made, building with friends, and a whole lot more. So please enjoy my conversation with Aaron Hoffman and John Zeno after a brief message from our sponsor. Lay of the Land is brought to you by John Carroll University's Bowler College of Business, widely recognized as one of the top business schools in the region. As we've heard time and time again from entrepreneurs here on Lay of the Land, many of whom are proud alumni of John Carroll University, success in this ever-changing world of business requires a dynamic and innovative mindset, deep understanding of emerging technologies and systems, strong ethics, leadership prowess, acute business acumen, all qualities nurtured through the Bowler College of business. With four different MBA programs of study spanning professional, online, hybrid, and one-year flexible, the Bowler College of Business provides flexible timelines and various class structures for each MBA track, including online, in-person, hybrid, and asynchronous, all to offer the most effective options for you, including the ability to participate in an elective international study tour, providing unparalleled opportunities to expand your global business knowledge by networking with local companies companies overseas and experiencing a new culture. The career impact of a Bowler MBA is formative and will help prepare you for this future of business and get more out of your career. To learn more about John Carroll University's Bowler MBA programs, please go to business.jcu.edu. The Bowler College of Business is fully accredited by AACSB International, the highest accreditation a college of business can have. So when we first connected, um, I had the opportunity to hear an abridged version of, of your guys' collective stories, which was awesome in and of itself. But ever since, I've just been very excited to sit down with both of you to hear the more unabridged version of, of said story and be able to share it with a lot more folks. Because you know, leading the witness, I kind of know the story is a lot of fun already. So I'm very much looking forward to it here. So thank you both for, for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Yeah, Jeffrey, appreciate it, man. Absolutely. So to kick us off, let's do a, a brief stage setting. If you want to just each, you know, briefly introduce yourselves and we'll we'll dive into your lifelong friends journey. Yeah, my name's John Zeno, co-founder of Deliver That. Not as much uh involved in the day-to-day management and operation as as much as I used to be, but uh but yeah, I'm living in Cleveland, Ohio now and just enjoying. Living on the west side. The best side. <laughs> Where, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm Aaron Hoffman. I'm, I'm one of the other founders of Deliver That. It's been an incredible, I would say, almost 11 years now, John, since we this this idea was born out of the dorm room. But our relationship, obviously, friendship, I should put it that way. You know, is is, is um, yeah, I laugh a little bit, but uh, you know, our, our friendship spawns back. I mean, basically to third grade when we first met each other at Strasser Elementary. 
So it's been we've we've known each other for a long time, and it's been uh, it's been such a privilege to build a company not only with John but a bunch of our other friends that we grew up with. Well, that that is a as good a place as any to to kick it off. You know, take us back to this this third grade friendship. You know, were, were you both always with this entrepreneurial inclination? You know, how is it that uh, that relationship evolved over time, and and you found yourself in a position where where you were even thinking about? you know, startups and, and businesses and, and these kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, for me, him and I, we were really friends for a while, maybe until like college, but we went to elementary school, middle school, high school, and then college together. And then we played baseball together in high school. And yeah, it's like, John, John, we, we were definitely, we were definitely friends. It's like, we, but we weren't like <laughs> hang out every weekend. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, back yeah. in the day, you have like summer parties and stuff with your friends. Like John and I weren't doing that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, our relationship really started in, uh, in high school, playing baseball together and, you know, hanging out outside of that. But, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit, my mom was always an entrepreneur. My dad used to own pretzel stores in Philadelphia, you know, so I watched him do that. And I think it's always kind of been in my blood and I would always sell things on eBay and we would do different, you know, different things to make money because I never wanted to get a normal job. So I think it was always in me. But it didn't really show until until college, truly. Yeah, I would say that uh, you know I, I have definitely been entrepreneurial like my entire life. I mean, I remember shoveling driveways when I was you know fourth, fifth grade, and you know the lemonade stands, garage sales. Like I was always oh, yeah. hustling to make oh, a yeah. buck. Yeah, you know, I think I think my my mom gave. I think I have it in my wallet still. I I I made business cards with my brother David when I was like fifth grade, and we would go pass them out on the neighborhood. For, you know mowing yards and yard work and mulching. And so it's like, I've, I've always had like the entrepreneurial bug. But when I, uh, when I went to college, I wanted to be a doctor. Not, this is going to sound terrible, but like typically people want to be doctors because they want to help people. I just wanted to make a lot of money. And, you know, when it, it became pretty, pretty clear to me that if you want to make a lot of money, one of the best ways to do it was to, you know, to, to own a company. So when we started with this idea about delivering food to, to college students or just anything really to college students at OU, quickly changed my major because this was the this is the path that was meant for me. And like John, you know, he's got his parents were entrepreneurs. Same with mine. You know, my dad, he owns two daycares. He's owned other companies. Mom and stepdad have been very entrepreneurial as well. They've been involved in other opportunities. So I, I'd say I'm well rounded from an entrepreneurial perspective. Mm. So. I was reflecting on our, you know, the the parts of the story that I remembered, and I thought a, a fun place to kind of introduce, deliver that would be, you know, when I think about most companies' first big breaks, I think it is quite rare that it's from a viral moment. And it, it's kind of rare still that, you know, that exaggerated elevation of status from virality has like any kind of durable staying power for a business. And so I love that, you know, many years later, it, it is really at the heart of your origin story. So I'd love if you could just tell us, you know, about what was happening there at the inception of this idea and, and going viral. <laughs> so, you know, the real story here behind why this started was John and I were rushing to paternity. I had recently transferred to Ohio University and, um, you know, we, I wanted to get involved in the campus and you know, Greek life was a great way. We had friends that were in a fraternity and like, okay, you know, why, why not join a fraternity? So we were rushing a fraternity and, you know, we were getting people food one day. Yeah. It's like the first cold day of the year in, in November. And I just remember having the idea, like, man, I would literally like pay someone to go get this food for us. <laughs> and I'm over like, I'm like <laughs> talking to John about this as we're walking to, if anyone's, you know, listening from Ohio University, we're going to Shively Dining Hall. <laughs> and really, I, I keep talking like, John, I'm seriously like, why wouldn't we, we should start a business, man. We should, we should start delivering kids anything, really. And uh, John, what would, I mean, what'd you tell me again? <laughs> what'd you say? But yeah, <laughs> I definitely said no, because we didn't have a car. So I don't know how we're going to do this. <laughs> The job, yeah, so, yeah, so the immediate inception of the idea was completely, you know, combated by John. Doesn't want to do it. Didn't want to do it. And, you know, so we, I think we get our food. We, we, we take it to somebody. We go, and we end up, no, we went to the library where everyone was at. All the mm -hmm. libraries. And yeah, I you know, say, I'm like, I'm like, with, you know, four, four boxes of food in each hand, you know, for all the brothers. <laughs> right? It's, like, it's just terrible. 
<laughs> yeah, it's all voluntary though. You did it by choice. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, no, we we um we uh we 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 go to this the, the library and I'm like, John, like, dude, like look at how many students are in here. Like we should be delivering everyone in this library food. Court shoots right up the road. You've got the dining halls. Like I'm sure people want to like get books to you know, like we should do this. And again, I think John at this time was like, okay, you know, like whatever, Aaron, it's one of your one of your ideas, like, you know, I'll go along with it. And we literally that night at the library, and then that light, yeah. Like that mm-hmm. night we went to the library, uh, and we we created our Twitter account. We created a Twitter account. No business, by the way. No idea, no thesis, no business plan, no way to do anything, no car, no bike. We created this account on Twitter. And, you know, I think we ended up getting a couple of like the large college accounts, like OU Crushes and whatever campus accounts, like they were retweeting one of our, treat, our tweets. And eventually, the, the vice president of the university at the time, Vice President Lombardi, he like retweeted us and like quoted it and was like, basically, at, I'm going to say, you know, promoting us, but like almost like saying, hey, students, like, check this out. This is awesome. Like, everyone should use this. And I remember, you know, like a day later, we had 4,000 followers and it was crazy. And we look at each other and we're like, dude, we have a business. Like, what are we like? What now? And it was, it was so cool because, you know, getting this company started with an idea like that. And like, that just kind of shows like the power of social media now. Like yeah. we literally had no business model, nothing. <laughs> we couldn't, ex- like, I mean, we had like 60 bucks cash to start with. And um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. I mean, it, it is awesome, but it, it, uh, you know, if, if you go back in time, you know, it was 60 bucks and, and far more demand than, you know, than you can supply at that, at that point in time. Like, you know, what, what do you do? <laughs> How do you try and meet the demand? Well, I mean, no one placed an order all weekend. I don't know when the first order was. Maybe it was like on the Tuesday or maybe the Monday. I remember night. exactly the first order. It was, I'll give him a shout out. It was Pat, Lo- it was Pat Logan from Chipotle. <laughs> All right. Pat Logan from Chipotle. Well, He's one of our fraternity brothers. I remember brothers. who. I just do remember yeah. when. I'm pretty sure you took the delivery, John. I'm almost positive oh, you yeah. did, didn't you? It was Absolutely. the Chipotle. It was a, yeah, it was a Chipotle. And they, they, you know, oh, youth campus is like where the, the dorms are at. It's probably about a 15, 20 minute walk to like where all like the court street is, where all the food's at. But you, and you have to go up a big hill. So I can just imagine John biking up this massive hill for his yeah. delivery, you know, and just delivered a bag of Chipotle, but that was it. And um, you, still you know, at the time, like, <laughs> yeah, not no car. Car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, you know, the, the bowl cost, what, like seven fifty, and like, we could, you know, we don't take credit cards. We don't have change on us. Like, so how do we even give people like, how do we tender cash correctly? And just, it was... It was bizarre. You know, I'll tell you what, never to do when starting a company is like, there was no way for us to accept orders besides like using my cell phone. So like my personal cell phone was the way that we first initially started receiving orders. And we would receive like texts saying like, hey, I want a burrito. Not like the contact information of the person (laughs) ordering, where they wanted the burrito from, where it's being delivered to, at what time. Like it was, it was, it was hilarious. So how, how do you begin to take this idea seriously? And at what point through this journey in college do you realize it's something you could commit yourself to beyond? That's a good question. I mean, it's evolved from cash and just us and friends doing deliveries. And then we started getting friends' cars. So we would, I don't know, fill up their tank at the end of the day or something. And then we had some students reach out to us to drive for us. And we were like, oh, yeah, I guess we should have, you know, employees or people work for us. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. And a lot of them to begin with were the, it was the basketball team because they weren't allowed to have, they weren't actually allowed to make money because they were there on scholarship. Mm. So we were just paying, you know, out cash every night. And so we just have these guys, you know, six, eight, six, ten, just bring them money back to us at the end of the night at 2 a.m. It was ridiculous. So funny. Uh, all so, nice guys. Too. So, oh, all yeah, great three. guys. So we did that, and I think eventually we, uh, you know, we understood some technology, you know, or at least you know, college kids learning. And so we started using Square, and these little Square readers were free. We just made an account. You'd ask them for them, and they would just send them to us. So then we just started accepting um, credit cards via Square. So that was kind of the next evolution, and then. Some students reached out to us. They wanted to build us a uh, a web app. 
So we ended up building a web app where we would be able to dispatch orders to drivers. Customers could order online. So we evolved from the cell phone to a web app, which is beautiful. Fair. And then we started launching some other campuses. We launched Miami. We launched OSU, Kent, you know, Akron a little bit. And we just learned it was really tough to get people excited because you could only pay a manager of a campus yeah, not even 500 bucks a week. So we would say, hey, we, we expect you to take this really seriously, but they're in school. And they're like, well, school is going to come first always. And we're like, well, yeah. we want you to take this serious, but we're only going to pay you, you know, a couple hundred bucks. So we learned it was tough to manage when you couldn't pay. That's for sure. <laughs> It became a challenge to manage these other campuses and, and the viral, you know, I thought we were marketing experts because we went viral. So we figured we could just do that at every other campus. And then we found out we couldn't do that at every other campus and that we're not marketing experts. So that was a nice, nice slap in the face. And then 2016, we were about to graduate. We started pitching OU to, they had money from the state, grant money for tech companies. So we learned about this and one of our professors helped us kind of curate a pitch and taught us how to pitch. And we pitched OU to invest in us, even though we really didn't have any technology. Aaron came up with an algorithm that would say uh, if the campus was worth launching at, and that was our tech. And they weren't, they weren't really having it, so they turned us down. But even before that, we actually tried to get, we were really close to getting on Shark Tank. Um, we were, I think there were like 30,000 applicants, and we were in the top 100. Mm. Sent a big video to him and almost got on and found out the producer, he invested in a, another campus delivery, something. So then they, we didn't get accepted. And then we pitched OU. So we had some practice pitching. And then we were turned down. And then by then it was, we were basically graduating. So we had the choice to, to continue. And I didn't want to get a job. I didn't do any, uh, any of the mock interviews or anything that most of the students were doing. We were just focused on building this business. And Graduation rolled around. We graduated. He went out to LA, did some programming stuff out there for the summer. I stayed at home, did some painting and contracting work. And then I told my yeah, friend Jeffrey, <laughs> let me tell you how, yeah. uh, let me tell you, let me just put this in work. This, this is funny. This is, let me tell you why we were never, ever going to get like a regular job. So at Ohio <laughs> University, right? You can, <laughs> you can create your own degree. So, so like, I don't have like a BA in finance or whatever, BA. I have a BSS in finance, <laughs> a bachelor's in specialized studies in finance from Ohio University. I made it myself. Then I have to go to the business school. And I think John did something similar, but it was even a more ridiculous degree. <laughs> like, what is it called, John? What is it? Yeah, that, real estate entrepreneurship not, principles. Real, <laughs> yeah, real estate <laughs> entrepreneurship principles. Sounds great. Sounds great. Putting them both to great use here. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's, and you know, I, I think why we, we went down that route was because we're going and we're building. So like we were, I mean, we were so invested in this business, right? And like, we would actually, you know, like I said, we switched our majors for it. It was actually a legitimate business degree at the time. But I remember being a, a, a junior and like, I'm learning my entrepreneurship, whatever, 300 level class. We're literally in the same class, listening to somebody talk to us about running a company and starting a company. And afterwards we go up to them and we're like, Hey, you know, like we have, some, we have a delivery service on, on, you know, a business on campus. And the guy basically told us, he's like, you know, I can't help you guys at all. I've never run a business, but he's teaching us about entrepreneurship. At that point, it's like, I couldn't take it serious anymore, right? I couldn't take what I was doing at Ohio University serious. Granted, I loved my four and a half years there. Surprised it wasn't five, but, um, you know, I, I wouldn't regret anything that we did. Yeah, yeah. I always found yeah, it, I mean, without, it's easier to learn in practice than in theory. And yes, it's, it's helpful absolutely. from a teacher's perspective, too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, know, I mean, without OU, we wouldn't have this business, but you know, to say you can, you'll be ready to build a business by being in class. I think that's like a little naive. You can get to principles for sure, but you just, you learn by doing and by trusting in yourself and you're not going to get that by not doing. So if that book ends, you know, the, the university chapter, I, I love, you know, kind of two ideas there. One is I mean, what, what is the state of delivery services at that time? You know, obviously today, I think all these names are, are, are quite commonplace. The, the Door Dashes, the Instacarts, you know, the, the Uber Eats of the world. But, you know, what, what, was, what was it like at that point in time? And, you know, from there, you know, take us through the, the inception of, of the next chapter. You know, coming come to Canton, 
And uh, I recalled the, the Ruby Tuesday light bulb moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ruby Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, I think... Uh, right. Yeah, John, go ahead and take us from that. Yeah, I mean, with, with DoorDash, DoorDash was... No one was doing college campuses. There might have been a company called Order Up, which I believe was acquired by Grubhub, that they were kind of on some campuses, but no one was really on any of the campuses that we were on. DoorDash, they were just doing big cities, mostly... Like in 2013, I think they might have launched in the same year or same area. But uh, over the next few years, they just went big cities and they raised a ton of money, right? So they had good tech. But they still were not touching the Cantons, the tier two cities, college campuses. And we thought we just expanded throughout college campuses. We could become a big, big enough thorn on their side that they would need to acquire us. Right. You know, outside of that, Uber Eats wasn't a thing. Uber, I think, was just really getting going. So yeah, so there really wasn't a ton of competition, at least where we were at, if we wanted to get bigger, there definitely would have been for sure. Yeah. You know, but you know, we, we tried. So after that summer in Los Angeles and, you know, we, we both came back to Canton, Ohio, where we're from. Yeah. It's a suburb of Maslin, Jackson Township. And we we still tried to get, you know, get our on-demand model to work in our hometown. We figured, you know, there's a lot of restaurants around, there's a lot of people, there's disposable money. Like, why wouldn't someone pay us six, seven bucks to go get their food in Jackson? So we still tried to get this model to work in our hometown. It's something completely novel to us at the time where it's like we were off college campuses and like in a suburban setting. Like we're from a very suburban area, Jackson Township, Ohio. And it didn't work. We were going up against the time, like I said, the Grubhubs, the Ubers, the DoorDashes. And they, at that point, were starting to get into more of like the tier two suburb areas. And at that point, you know, they're driving demand to restaurants, something we never did, right? We never really had hooks into a POS or like, we didn't have any software really, like we weren't driving demand. Mm. And I remember this would have been, so that would have been later, late 2016. In 2017, we're going, we, early 2017, we go into Ruby Tuesday. I mean, actually late 2016. We go into Ruby Tuesday, yeah. a local Ruby Tuesday. And... Like we're pitching them on the on-demand model. Like, hey, like we'll take all of your on-demand deliveries. Like we'll do the best job ever, you know, we're cheaper, better, faster, whatever. And they're like, no, dude, we, we don't need that. Like we're good there. But he's like, you know, I got, and he had catering orders, right? These are large orders. These are like a couple hundred dollars a piece, maybe a thousand bucks, right? He had nine or 10 of them lined up in booths. He's like, you know what? I need help with there. These deliveries right here. These deliveries can't go with a DoorDash or Uber. And he, t- he quickly educated us on like, you got to look good. You got to be polite. You got to be, you're, pre- you're, you're presenting, you're a part of our brand at this moment when you go take a catering order. You got to set the food up. And we took one of the catering orders, I'll never forget, to a, uh, you know, a close like doctor's office. It's like a hospital slash, do- slash doctor's office. Went in there. Everyone was happy to see us. Set the food up real nice. Took us five minutes. Said please and thank you. We were wearing you know, slacks and a polo. We weren't wearing like shorts and a t-shirt. And like, I remember, you know, handing someone a receipt and them signing a nice like $30, $40 gratuity on it. And like, at that moment, we look at each other, we're like, dude, we could do this. We know our drivers will want to take these deliveries because look at the tip. we You'd have to work four or five hours on our platform to make the same amount of money. And at that moment, that's the light bulb, right? Where it's like, hey, let's stop trying to compete with the billion dollar, the funded, the companies that have already established that have, like I said, way better technology, way, you know, way more funded than we are. Let's try to find, carve out a specific area in this market, which ended up being catering delivery, where we can dominate. And it was that was the moment. From then on, I think a couple months later, we shut down our entire. By the way, the the, the, you know, the college delivery services, OU delivery, Kent State, the, you know, all the, these campuses, they were still making money. We were like, you know what, we're shutting them down. We're going all in on this. And we did. And, you know, that was probably, that was the the big pivot for us was getting away from trying to compete for the smaller orders and just specialize in a specific type of delivery. And we took that and we expanded, man, like we went from Jackson Township, Ohio to Northeast Ohio, which would be Cleveland, Akron, Canton. And then we just literally expanded it like that. Probably until John, I mean, John has opened, he's probably been to like 90 of the states here. You know, like he's been to every state pretty much <laughs> where it's like, I mean, seriously, the man's like a road warrior. I mean, we did, we have to go into markets. We would literally just replicate what we did at Ruby Tuesday. We'd find four or five drivers. We'd find a couple of restaurants. We were like, okay, let's do catering delivers. And that was it. Mm. 
It was awesome. I love. I, I I still look back at that time and think that was what has kept this business alive. Where was we weren't funded. We had no capital. It was John and I, John and I were spending all the you know is our money we're making spending on keeping this business afloat. And like I feel like that was the that really instilled like we're not going to fail if we can make this work. You know. Yeah. Well, one point of contrast, you know, relative to the delivery service competitors at that time that that you had mentioned you know, beyond the niche of, of catering is I think pulling on this, this thread that you just started to introduce there was, you know, your guys' whole operating philosophy about growing profitably and, and with cash flow positivity, which is, you know, in uh, complete opposition to the philosophy of the, you know, Uber venture backed organizations, you know, growing at the literal expense of cost. I mean, it's, I think it, I think it shows that there are, there's not just one path. You don't have to just raise and get diluted into oblivion, you know? <laughs> I think there are well, many I'm, ways that you, could, that you can build a business, right? But we just wanted to do it the right way that we thought was right, which was just always making money, not overspending, being frugal. And yeah, like Aaron said, I think that that kept us in it. I think if we were given, you know, $20 million, you might have looked at this quite a, di- quite a bit differently, starting to get a salary and you're a couple years out of college. I, you know, I, I don't know how I would have looked at it, but I just knew that we had to do it and that was the only option. I always felt, you know, we could always go get a job if this doesn't work. So why not just let's go all in and let's just, let's do it. So yeah, I don't, I don't think there's one way to build a business, but I think I'm um, maybe now it's a little different. Funding's definitely quite a bit tougher to, uh, you know, to have access to. So, you know, I think going profitably for the next few years might be a good, uh, good way to build a business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just what John was saying, like, I, you know, we both lived, I lived in my, in my dad's basement for two or three years. Like we paid ourselves a hundred bucks per week. We didn't pocket any of the money we took when we took deliveries. Like we literally invested every bit of money back in this business. And to me, that's what has created this resiliency. It's why, which we'll get into later about when our business, when COVID hit and we're delivering to corporate clients, our business essentially evaporated overnight, 95% gone, and which I'll get into that here obviously later. But um, yeah, I mean, we've, we, we still to this day, we, I mean, we've had, man, I want to say over 40 straight months of cash flow, pro- like profitability straight every single month. And it's been, it's been an incredible way to operate a business. And I, if I look back on doing it again, I don't think I would change a thing with how we run it. Honestly, mm-hmm. I've seen too many businesses yeah. raise capital on an idea and not a real business. And we had a legitimate business that was generating cash, that was generating revenue, that were paying people, paying drivers, that was delivering true value to consumers. I don't think that that would have been possible if we, were, if we raised capital. Yeah, I mean, one thing we always said was, we just, if we bring value, we'll get paid. And we were doing the on-demand delivery, we, we just weren't bringing enough value, whether it was to our customers through you know, an app that wasn't well done, whether it's through the restaurants that we're not bringing them enough revenue. And then finally someone said, Hey, I will pay you to solve my problem. And the light bulb went off like, okay, someone's actually saying they have a problem now. You know, it wasn't really that big of a problem back then that you had to get, you were too lazy to go get Chipotle yourself. Right. But it is definitely a problem if a restaurant that makes three grand a day can't deliver, you know, five, $300 catering orders. That's 50% 50% of their revenue for the day. That's a real problem, right? And they will pay to have that problem fixed. So that's, uh, that's definitely been all the difference. If we would have had money, maybe we wouldn't have been searching, you know, as hard to bring value to, to our customers and drivers and things like that. So yeah, I would never change anything. Mm. I mean, well, there's this, you know, old adage of, you know, scarcity is, is the mother of, of invention. Well, and I am curious you know, as, as part of the journey, you know, with that theme in mind, you know, at what point, and, and maybe, you know, this is kind of the crucible moment with COVID and the 95% drop, Aaron, that you mentioned, but at what point did you guys begin to think longer term about this business rather than, you know, here's the opportunity immediately in front of us? And like, where, where did a, a longer term vision come into play? And what, what is that? What was that vision originally? Yeah. I'll, you know, I'll back up again to where we pivoted to catering, right? At yeah. that time, you know, we're starting to really see that catering is a, is a legit nest, like it's a necessity. 
to you know, catering fulfillment, like delivery fulfillment, like it was a problem, not just for one restaurant, Ruby Tuesday, for every single one of them, besides a Panera Bread at the time, who, you know, had hundreds of orders per day per location. They had their own fleet, had their own, they had the infrastructure to deliver themselves. No one else really did. And, you know, so we, over the next, you know, 18 months, right? This should have been 2017 going into 2018, going into the half 2018. We built some really strong relationships with some restaurant brands. One, I'll shout them out right now. They're they're local to Northeast Ohio, Old Carolina Barbecue. They were, you know, really, I think our second client ever. And they were, I mean, they're really, again, I'll shout out Brian Bailey too. You know, his guidance and mentorship through those years helped us again, understand that catering was significantly different than a takeout or a mealtime order. And that there needed to be a different level of service, a different tech stack, different tooling, just this. It was a different business, right? And what happened through that was he, they, they obviously relied on us to do these, you know, these catering deliveries. And we were kicking ass. And, you know, there was a, a small PE, family PE um, in Canton, Ohio that had invested in them that he introduced us to. I think at that point, we were starting to get more serious. Like, hey, you know, we're actually, we're actually doing something cool here. We've got maybe three or four different employees at that moment, we had my brother, Dan. We had our now CEO, who was a driver to start, Darian Terrell. And we also had Jimmy Danke, who was our brand manager at the time. And we were, I, I, I might be bringing somebody else, but I'm, you know, it's so long ago. But these, you know, we had a couple ma- major employees and we're like, okay, like we can run this thing. We can keep building this, but we need more. Like, first off, John and I got to get paid. We got to get out of the basement, right? Got to get out of my dad's basement. <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. live in that house anymore with, with, there. with that man. <laughs> can't, can't do that anymore. Oh. And then I was like, at the same time, like we need an injection of capital to grow this thing. But we weren't doing like, we, the, the business still wasn't legitimate. Like we weren't, we weren't doing financial statements. We didn't have like any idea, like if we were really making money or not, besides looking at our bank account. And so, you know, the PE that got involved, they're still involved today. Like I said, they're the CEO of that, of that company is now our CXO. Daryl Miller and man, they have been, he's been, you know, a godsend to our business. He came in and immediately legitimized the business. I think they pumped in a hundred, maybe a little over a hundred thousand dollars, half of that. So John and I each took 25,000 a piece off the table. It's really just back pay for all the time that we spent the last yeah. three or four years not getting paid. Um, and that, and, and 25K at the time, that man, that was oh, so much money to me. That was inc- I, a crazy amount of money. I remember we were in, we were launching Phoenix when we, uh, Closed the deal, and I got money. I got hit my bank account first. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you work from the face. Oh, it was great. Yeah, but, but yeah, like twenty grand, twenty five. It was so much. I couldn't believe it. I was like, "Wow, this is actually." We are bringing value. We're finally, you know, getting paid on that. Uh, Someone's recognized done. Us. And uh, yeah, and like you know, we 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 didn't have an office. We were literally working out of my dad's basement. I'm not. That's not an exaggeration. So like, yeah, you know, the PE came in. He, he immediately started doing financial statements, something that was really, you know, it was just, it was core to what he does. He's a CPA as well. But like, you know, he got us an office space. He helped us legitimize the business forecasting. And from that moment, we literally started growing like crazy. I think we launched from basically, that was May of 2018 or June of 2018 when we closed this, this funding. Basically then, all the way up until COVID, right? March of 2020, we were nonstop growth mode, sending people left and right to markets. That's why I say John spent basically the, the greater part of a year and a half on the road. Same with Darian, same with me, same with Jimmy. I mean, we were, I mean, there's another guy, Christian, who's our VP of partnerships now. Like he launched Seattle. He launched so many more. Mar- like we were literally on the ground in these markets, meet and greeting drivers, talking to the restaurants, launching these places, just like we did at Ruby Tuesday in Canton, you know, in Jackson Township. It was the exact same, the exact same playbook. I think uh, the one thing that we always did, especially with the bootstrap model, yeah, we knew we could do this ourselves, ourselves. So we needed teammates and people to work with us. But uh, we always just paid everyone else first. It was the only way. You know, I think it, it would have been different if we would have raised a lot of money. Everyone's making money. Everyone's comfortable. None of us were comfortable. Right. So we're all just trying to become comfortable and actually own, you know, anything. That's just something that we always did. And it worked out so well, where if everyone else was paid 
they would stick around and we didn't have to do literally everything. We could just do 80% of what we were doing instead of 100%. That was something I think we did really well. Lay of the Land is brought to you by Impact Architects and by 90. As we share the stories of entrepreneurs building incredible organizations in Cleveland and throughout Northeast Ohio, Impact Architects has helped hundreds of those leaders, many of whom we have heard from as guests on this very podcast, realize their own visions and build these great organizations. I believe in Impact Architects and the people behind it so much that I have actually joined them personally in their mission to help leaders gain focus, align together, and thrive by doing what they love. If you two are trying to build great, Impact Architects is offering to sit down with you for a free consultation or provide a free trial through 90, the software platform that helps teams build great companies. If you're interested in learning more about partnering with Impact Architects or by leveraging 90 to power your own business, please go to ia.layoftheland.fm. The link will also be in our show notes. So not to, you know, jump the gun because we'll, you know, we'll get there, but understanding, you know, that where you are today as a, you know, multi tens of millions top line business, tens of thousands of drivers on the platform, you know, a a sizable organization uh, on the team itself. You know, I have to ask about the the COVID moment and a 95% drop. That sounds like, I mean, truly existential moments for the business. What did you guys learn through the process and implement in the business that allowed you, you know, to get from this existential place of, you know, is, is the business going to survive to, to the place where, where you are today? All right. Well, well, I know we can take us one job. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Can you, okay. He might have cut out there, but um, no, I mean, for me, Jeffrey, it was, I mean, G, uh, February of 2020 was our first profitable month ever as a company. Okay. Wow. Like, like, like yeah. when we pivoted to catering. <laughs> so February yep. 2020, I think it was like a couple thousand dollar profit. We were going crazy about it. John and I are in Vancouver visiting one of our advisors in like the, the week, I think like March 8th or March 9th. And like when they were getting ready to close the borders, essentially. And like, I remember we go back to our hometown and, you know, fly back here and like the whole world shuts down. Our business goes down 95% overnight. Cause at the time, think about it. We're, we're do, the, the majority of catering, you guys, if the people are listening out there, it's, it's the corporate clients. It's not to like a grad party. There, there are a lot of orders like that that go to, you know, residential places, but the, you know, the, the vast majority of catering business, it's, it's business catering. It's going to offices, hospitals, guy scrapers. So you have to think at that time when COVID hit, no one's really at those places besides, you know, like a hospital. Right. And like, at the same time, like you're not going to have group large buffet style orders in all in one area at a hospital. It's like, so it moved to like individually packaged orders and, you know, COVID was such a disaster on so many levels, but I will say I will credit it as being the, one of the most defining moments for our business. It helped us fix every single hole in the business. I'm going to talk about our market launches, for example. We had to spend tens of thousands of dollars on hotels, flights, cars, sending people in there. We introduced some technology where we could do that all virtually. We could launch markets with no human you know, in that market. Uh, and it's, it's because we developed software to onboard drivers virtually, qualify them, you know, make sure that they they uh, they have the right equipment, test their knowledge around delivery. So, you know, our driver acquisition process before, you know, pre-COVID, you had to have a driver go on a delivery with another driver, call them the ride along. And like, I mean, COVID hits, you can't have people, you know, that are in the same car together. You don't know what's going on. So we, that was all, that was all, you know, we, we basically brought that all and did it digitally. And by doing those two things, we damn near tripled our coverage within six months. At this point, we covered basically every major market in the country. There was no like outlier cities. We were everywhere. And what that allowed us to do is before we were able to, you know, one of the biggest pain points of, of, of scaling a business, like a delivery business, is when you want to service a large client. Let's take like a Panera Bread. We don't work with Panera, by the way. Okay. But a Panera Bread, you know, they're, they want one throat to choke right? They want to use one service. Well, if you don't cover 90 plus percent of their stores, they're never going to use you. 
So like that was one of the biggest barriers to entry for us is that we didn't have coverage everywhere like DoorDash did. But when COVID hit, we did. So that was like our immediate in with restaurants, enterprise restaurants that wanted to offer catering delivery at scale, you know, through our services. So COVID sucked. I mean, it's terrible, but you know, when, when we, it helped, it's helped our business significantly. And I credit that as another pivotal moment where we got into more of like the software business, right? COVID is the reason why, you know, at the time I was CEO of the company, I was CEO for eight years. And, you know, when, at the tail end of COVID, this would have been like November of 21, you know, we made a decision like as a board, like I'm stepping down as the CEO and I'm embarking on learning the software side of, you know, of our industry. And my job was to immerse myself for four to six months in this, learn how to develop software so I could hire someone that could come in a CTO that could come in and build our technical team. Like, I'm so proud of that. And I had to rewire my brain. I mean, John could tell you about that, those stories. Like, it was crazy. Like, something out of a movie. Like, every day, constantly watching videos, taking classes. Like, I, you know, we just actually, like, our first application we ever used that we self, like, self posted. I, I wrote the script, like, I wrote the program. And I was, I was so proud of that. But, um, we, you know, hired a CTO. Um, and that was like sort of like the COVID pivot, right? Is like, hey, let's stop. You know, we're a services business. But like it needs to be tech enabled now because nothing we used off the shelf, a third party service ever met 100% of our needs. We had to start building custom stuff. Yeah, there were, there were really a few things, you know, the software never met our needs because it was always built for on-demand delivery or it was built for the small orders or it was built for a restaurant to run their own delivery drivers out of their, uh, their own restaurant. So it was never a third party catering delivery service software out there. But we lost so many clients. Uh, you know, Zoe's Kitchen, which now is Kava, you know, Qdoba, Moe's. We lost all of these clients because we would tell them we could do, you know, all of their deliveries and then we would only show up 75% of the time. Well, that doesn't exactly cut it with catering. And, you know, when we were only making money on deliveries that we actually delivered, we could only make so much money. And we knew the only way you could get higher coverage or a better success rate or a better fill rate is if you received more deliveries. So you could batch deliveries together, but you couldn't get more deliveries if you were messing up. So it was really difficult to get more. And then we introduced software. And you know now we take 99, 98% of every delivery that's submitted to us. Quality's through the roof because we now are able to receive more deliveries. And yeah, the software has been... And even before... We were advised to not build software, so it was who's going to fit, who's going to who's going to be the one that we can trust that would actually be able to manage a CTO or a developer. Yeah. How am I going to manage a developer? I don't know how to speak that language. How do I know if they're even doing a good job? And Aaron just went all in and figured it out, and yeah, it was incredible. Right. Changed the the course of the company. Wow, I, I feel like it's it's one of these perennial. And it, it's it's interesting because it can swing both ways on the pendulum, but like this recognition of the importance of vertical integration and in-house development as like a core competency yeah. of a growing company. Yeah, it was the only option because we, we wanted to just lease the software, and we would we would have just paid someone if they had it. And yeah, I mean, because you think about it, it, like our like our software team, like man, these guys are. I mean, they're. They're, they're so smart, right? And intelligent people, they cost a lot of money. But at the time, the reason why we shied away from ever building software, it wasn't because we didn't know what to build. We didn't know what to build. It's always been the same. Like we've always had these ideas of like the correct way to, you know, manage deliveries at scale. But like it was expensive. It goes back to our philosophy of like, hey, we don't want to shell out a bunch of cash going red or have to raise capital just to hire somebody to build software. That might work, right? We have something that's producing cash right now. Let's prove that out first. And if it makes sense, right, then, you know, we'll, we'll take this in-house, which we did. It got to a point when I want to say we got to maybe eight, nine million in revenue where it's like, listen, if we don't start, this would have been, like I said, you know, November 21, the tail end of COVID. It's like, if we don't start building software and adapting and building things that are curated specifically to our business and our use case and our, what we're bringing to the market. Like we're gonna we're gonna cap you know, cap out here pretty soon. So we recognized that before it hit. 
And the software we have built over the last two years is one of a kind. It's revolutionary. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like it that exists currently. So yeah, I'm gonna just tip my hats to Matt Benzel, Matt Pavkov, and our entire development team that had they're they're ridiculously they're they're ridiculously smart. It's crazy, like what those guys yeah. can do. And they definitely took a uh, a gamble on us. That's for sure. So never forget that. And even if we weren't going to go down building a software route, I mean, we were, our whole business was tied through Zapier. So, I mean, how many Zaps were we doing a month? Five, five million? I mean, 10 million? That was ridiculous. That was right? like, like so, yeah, I was the tech guy and it was that everything was stitched together basically through Zapier or G scripts or whatever. It was just, yeah, but like, uh, oh, it's, like it's the daylight wild, savings wild time. Like, daylight savings time. Everything's broken. But <laughs> now you got to read it. Yeah. You know, it's like, every delivery is off by an yeah, wow. it, it was expensive and it didn't, it wasn't that, it wasn't stable and we had no choice. It just get riskier and riskier and refunding orders. And yeah, so we were really forced. It was just, it was difficult. So, so what is this future of, of catering and delivery that you guys are, are forging here? And what is, you know, what is the role that deliver that plays in, in that future? Um, and, and what is, you know, really, what is, what is your vision for, for the space going forward? Yeah. So like, you know, one of the reasons why we're, we, like we said earlier, I got getting into the software is because, you know, something we've noticed is being like operators of a delivery business. It's like, you, you know, the software that's being built is not being built by operators. And it's, that's clear as day. It's, it's being mm-hmm. developed by, you know, a theory or a thought around what to build, you know, sort of like a broad stroke around, Hey, how do I service the most amount of people through this product? Which is, you know, we've, We've used other delivery manager products before. I'm not going to name them, obviously. But um, again, like they've serviced companies like a Walmart, like a cannabis delivery company, an alcohol delivery company. But nothing was really ever built for catering. Catering is, I would call it the most difficult delivery use case because, you know, you only have, you have such small windows to hit from a delivery perspective. And you're actually relying on restaurants to produce such a significant qu- quantity of food all at the same time. It's very difficult to line up correctly. Okay. So, you know, you have to, you have to arrive at a specific time. You have to drop off at a specific time. If you drop off late, you're going to ruin a sales meeting. You're never going to get that customer ever again. So talk about, you know, when we did on-demand delivery, right? You could show up 20, 30 minutes late to the restaurant, show up an hour late to the customer. And the customer is not going to be happy, but it's like, they're still going to eat the food, right? Like they're not going to, you know, they might not order as frequently as well, but they, you know, they will try you again. I mean, I think the proof there is DoorDash or Uber Eats right now. Like, I mean, I use yeah. DoorDash and like there are, there are times when foods are late. It's okay. It's not a big deal. I, I understand. But when you're talking about a, Hey, I'm selling to a group of medical, you know, doctors and I'm, I'm bringing a thousand dollar order in. It's got to look good and it's got to be, it's going to wow them or else I'm not going to get my $50,000, $100,000 dollar sale here. That's life or death for these sales reps. So I wanted to say that because that's why we started building the software because no one was truly solving that problem of doing catering delivery or managing catering delivery. And another big part why we're doing catering delivery management is because the restaurants themselves are treating catering, a lot of them are treating catering like it's a burrito going to a college kid. They don't understand that the production, the staffing, the inventory check, so I would tell you what we're building right now is a full end-to-end solution for managing catering delivery. It's a full catering solution from the time a customer places an order to the time it, you know, it's dropped off and set up and there's a picture of the delivery, you know, in the restaurant's back office. Like we're, we're building the first end-to-end solution for that. What does success look like then in this context? And how have you, you know, both kind of thought about it? And Aaron, I'll prompt, you know, if you go back to your desires to have been a doctor originally, you know, like what, what do you find is motivating you guys at at this point? I would say for me, it was always about money. Right. And then, you know, I'll be honest, like we've been making really good money for, you know, three, three years now, John, right. I'd say, right. You know, we started profiting heavily in July of 2020. Okay. That was when we first really started turning pride. We haven't, we have not had a month since we have not profited. And so like, I always thought the end game for me, like what, what meant the most to me was getting, you know, my bank account getting bigger and it's it starting to get in at, 
it got bigger, right? And I still wasn't fulfilled. So I think for me, what I have learned is that I really want to make an impact and bring value to society. And the money that comes along with it is just a byproduct. So for me, it's less about money now. And it's more about, I want to create something cool that people find useful. It doesn't need to be like, I don't need to cure cancer. I don't need to do something like that's going to revolutionize mankind. But I want to bring value to the market and whatever I do. So I think for me, that's what I look at as success. You know, the people, the, the drivers that drive on a platform, are they happy? Are they getting well compensated? Do they like driving for us? You know, do our employees like waking up? And you know, are they energized coming into work? You know, do it. Do the customers and restaurants that use our services, do they love it? Like, do they have, you know, do they want to use it again and again and again? That's what keeps me going now. I love that. Yeah, I think uh, when you say you want to help people, it's kind of cliche, but if you break it down a little bit more, it makes a little more sense. You know, when it was the same thing, right? I was like, I wanted to make money and get stuff and be able to do things and not have to worry and go out to eat and not have to, you know, worry about how much it costs and all those things. And then, you know, not to say that we're absolutely wealthy, but, you know, now you don't have to worry about as much as what you used to worry about, right? So like when you have money, it's different, but when you don't have money, that's the only thing that matters. But now it's, you know, I want to spend time doing things that I enjoy, which is bring, bring value to people, which ultimately is helping people. You know, when you see people in our business that are happy to come to work, like Aaron said, and we have this great culture and people actually care. It's so cool to see other people get excited about, you know, what we initially came up with and now watching them put their own ideas and them build it themselves and put their name, you know, their stamp on our company. That's incredibly fulfilling. But now, I mean, at least for me, not being in the business every single day, you know, I kind of taken that into the real estate world and helping other businesses here in Cleveland. And I'm still getting that same fulfillment where it's like, yeah, I want to work with people that want to do something, right? There's tons of people that say they want to do things and, but then they don't, you know, I always want to be around people that actually do want to do things and that want to work hard and want to build something and make an impact and ultimately help people. And that to me is what success is. There's really no, there's no like money or value or, you know, size of the business or, you know, I want a hundred buildings or it's just, you know, I want to feel good about myself every day that I'm actually bringing value. That's, I think that's what I got addicted to doing deliver that. And that's the thing that keeps me going now. Mm. Wow. Both well said. I appreciate those sentiments very much. You know, I think one of the the fun things about recounting your collective stories chronologically is you know you get to pick up on some of those mistakes made along the way at that moment in time and how you guys have both thought about them and and grown respectively as as leaders and, and operators. I, I am curious from you know this vantage point when you reflect on it, mistakes made that we haven't talked about and you know some of the the more powerful lessons learned along the way that uh, yeah. still inform and are like, kind of like top of mind in your decision-making processes? Yeah, I think uh, getting emotional mm. when things would go wrong or things would be too good or, you know, so many times we talked about, oh, killed that meeting, we're going to get that contract. And then if you said you got it, you never <laughs> ended up getting it. <laughs> so definitely getting too emotional and starting a business as a roller coaster. So acknowledging that, something Jim and I have always said to each other, like when it's really bad, we're like, so the roller coaster, so we signed up for it. So we would say that back and forth. I think, you know, one of my big mistakes was probably, you know, biting off more than I could chew and, you know, not doing what I said I was going to do. So being more intentional about, you know, what is actually possible and that I will actually get done. I think that definitely made it tough. I just always said yes to everything because that's what I thought needed to be done. And then that ended up biting me in the ass and biting other employees and teammates in the ass. Yeah, I think those two are the main things I think about the most. I, mean, I would say for me, there, there's two things that come to mind. One is I could tell you how to lose a contract within 30 seconds if you ever wanted to know. <laughs> yeah, I, was like, I, was the king of, I was the king of that when we were first getting going. Oh. Yeah, I could tell you so God. many stories from telling, you know, I didn't realize that there were, this, this just sounds so immature, but like, I didn't understand what payment terms, like there was like nets, you know, net seven, 14, 30. So I thought when you issued an invoice, essentially, it needs to be paid in full right then and there. 
And man, I would go at restaurants, like pay your bills. Like, what are you talking? Like we, like you collected the money, like pay us. Like, so like there, there's, there's those things would just, I would say like just being immature with my knowledge of how to operate a business or to be like, you know, customer facing that I've had to learn the hard way. You know, I would say that, that, and, and this would have been, you know, back in like 2017, 2018. So it's like, this is so long ago, but I would say one thing that stands out to me right now that I still struggle with today. Well, you know, that it's a problem that I think will never go away is understanding when you're getting into business, okay, of any kind, it doesn't matter what business you're going into. The most difficult part of it is going to be managing and leading people. Okay. And this is going to be the most difficult thing you're ever going to face ever with running an organization, especially one at scale. Until there is ro- until there are robots everywhere doing our jobs for us, which I don't believe is going to happen for a long time. You're going to have to deal with the human element. So when I talk about mistakes I've made with, with, with like in that aspect, you know, hiring people that shouldn't have been hired and letting them stick around for too long, you know, not developing people or being a good resource to them like they, like they, like they deserved. Letting people stick around too long or, for, you know, it's simple, simple as that. What about when you need to fill a role like in a company? You know, it. The, what we used to do, just put the, the most senior person in that role, in that manager role, when that does not work at scale. Like, so like I would say the biggest problems and biggest hurdles I would say is like realizing that when you're in business, you need to be, especially when you're running a business, like you need to be so in tune with your people, managing, developing, getting the right people on the right seat on the bus, getting the wrong people off the bus as fast as possible. That is the biggest thing I would say. Yeah. Yeah. The speed of those decisions is critical for sure. How have you both managed the change in your relationship to the company that you, you founded together? You know, as you both have very different roles, both as company has grown since when you started, where it is today, degrees of involvement. How have you just thought about the evolution of your relationship to your own company? I would say last summer was probably the hardest summer with this business for sure as I was starting to phase out of the day-to-day, I was probably the most unhappy I've been in ever, just trying to figure out where I would bring value. That's definitely been challenging. But I think, you know, early on, we were really good with uh, letting other people make decisions. So I think getting used to that has helped the transition of, you know, owning every decision to owning some to not having to make virtually any besides, you know, super long-term, you know, things that we're building. So I think it's, I think we've done a really good job of managing our kind of expectations, but it's still tough when someone makes a wrong decision and you knew you had the answer. It's always going to be difficult, but that's what a business is unless you want to, unless you want to do every single job. We often get told like, don't ever go and we were told constantly coming up when we were coming, you know, putting this business together. It's like, I don't know if you can do business with friends. Like you're not gonna be friends with them much longer. And I'll tell you right now that if John and I are the the like we're the edge case that because our friendship has never ever been impacted at all between our business, whether it's been a decision we didn't disagree on or that that we disagreed on, which have been countless, by the way. Mm -hmm. We don't see eye to eye on everything. Hopefully not you know, having to have tough conversations with each other, you know, me with like, Hey, Aaron, you're not the best CEO. You're a good strategist. You should be in a role that better suits you. And me to John be like, Hey man, like it's time to pass the baton to somebody else. And you, and you take a lesser role. Those are tough pills to swallow as an individual. But when your best friend, John's my, he's my best friend, right? My best man at my wedding. So like, I can't speak highly enough about him. And like, I would say right now, like our friendship has never once and to my knowledge, at least, it never once been impacted. We golf every single week together. We hang, we're hanging out tonight. Like, it's definitely, there is this business side to this, right? When it's like, hey, we put the business hat on, it's business. You can have tough conversation, but it has never once impacted our friendship, ever. Hmm. For me, I always knew it was in our, in our best interest to, you know, just leave it at, at business. It's like, okay, whatever decision we're making, it's for the better of both of us anyway. So, you know, I, I was able to kind of conceptualize that, but yeah, we've had, you know, crazy arguments and, you know, it, it helped them. It didn't, 
I used to say it, it was it worked because we never lived together. But then during COVID, I lived in his attic for you know six months, so that kind of changed. <laughs> but you know, us being able to you know go our separate ways for the night and then reconvene and get back after it—that's been uh, that was always helpful. But yeah, I agree. I think uh, and I think if, you know if I did this with someone who wasn't my friend, I don't know if it would if I would have enjoyed it as much because we can celebrate and enjoy and we can laugh about all the stupid stuff we had to do. And, you know, this driver, this restaurant or what they would say to us and, you know, or the, you'd go to, you know, Cleveland clinic and they would say, you know, drop it off here, but they wouldn't give you a sweet number and there's no phone number. Like all those things that you can't, <laughs> you just can't, I don't know, relive with someone who might not be uh, one of your best friends. It's, it's been awesome. That's for sure. And it seems like we're just getting started too, which is just absolutely wild. Every new evolution of the business, it just, it just keeps going. You know, our roles yeah, are just it's, changing. It's crazy. I mean, you know, to, to go from zero to, you know, 25 million in sales and, you know, I mean, that's just, that's just, yeah, you know, there's publicly traded companies that don't do that much in revenue. It's like, it's, it's crazy the kind of scale we're hitting now. And, we're, and the fact that we're getting into software, which will, you know, I'll just take a, a, a quick hot take here. It's like, yeah, I think we're going to yeah. be a hundred million top line business in three years. I really do. I think if you look at what we're building, the software and then the addressable market, I mean, there's no reason why we can't get there. I mean, we're positioned well right now. And, um, you know, again, I, that's not possible. In my opinion, it's not possible. John and I aren't yin and yang in the last 11 years. If we're not on the road building this thing, building the culture, building the teams, right? Having the tough discussions, right? Having the no ego, like, you know, it might be tough for us to swallow when things have to change, but at the end of the day, like, it's the best thing for our company, like John said. So, wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Very cool. What do you feel is, is left unsaid? If anything, you know, particularly important parts, reflections that, uh, you would like to bring up that, that we haven't talked about. Yeah. I mean, just, this isn't like, this isn't so much like about my story, right? It's just, you know, we, John yeah. and I are both, you know, in our separate lanes outside of deliver that, like, like, you know, he works in real estate and advises other companies in that area. I advise some startups and other types of businesses. And one thing that if, if, if you're thinking about starting a business of any kind, right. You know, you got to realize that this success, these things you see on social media or like these success stories, 99.999% do not happen overnight. You might have one viral moment, like where something happens or you develop, you know, a product that just gets crazy scale really quick. But I'm telling you, man, if you're going to start a business of any kind, develop a product, like you need to go in with that mentality. It's going to take you at minimum 10 years, the minimum, minimum. You're, you're going to have to, and you're going to have to work. You're not, I think Elon Musk says this, like no one accomplishes anything on a 40 hour work week. I can't tell you how many weeks and the hundred hour weeks I have spent on this business. It's like we're constantly working, to be honest. So at least we were. You know, we have to we have time to ourselves now. But like, I mean, you have to. It's such a commitment to run a company and start a company. People understand that. That's number one. Number two, another th critical error I see that young entrepreneurs, the ones that come out of college, typically, right? They have a great idea. Great, phenomenal idea for a product or service. I'm advising one right now that is, that's around a pickleball concept, but mm -hmm. there's no thought whatsoever about how to generate money on your business. So if you're going to start a company, you can't just have the mindset of like, I'm going to raise capital because I've got a cool idea. No, 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 no. You've got to be able to show an investor or someone that you're going to raise that money from that you, you have to prove the concept that you can generate revenue. There is a market. There's a legitimate strategy and there's a legitimate, a legitimate way to get scale. I see too many founders that I, that I advise that do not have a thorough idea on how to generate money with their idea. So th those are the only two things that I wanted to point out. If you're listening, you're thinking about getting into a business, just think about making money and think about you're going to invest a lot of time. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I mean, if you're a, you know, a business owner or a founder or whatever, and, you know, I'm always willing to chat with anyone that actually wants to do anything. But I think, you know, with us, we just listened to our customers and, you know, you might not be right, but the only way you fail is if you give up, right? Like we could have just given up 
when people weren't ordering from us in Canton, Ohio, because we had an app made that wasn't that great. And we could have said, you know, yeah, the on-demand model, just it's not going to work, right? But what we did for those, you know, three, four years before going into catering, we just learned how to interact with drivers and interact with restaurants and customers and learn customer service. And we learned all this stuff. We learned all these things that we needed to ultimately do, you know, what ended up working. So definitely be be willing to pivot and be flexible and roll with the punches. And customers will literally just tell you what they will pay, what they will pay you for. <laughs> right? You might you might think they want you, they want this, but they're just gonna say, no, I actually want this. And sometimes you just you should listen. You don't need to listen to every single customer, but you know, there are some that might just tell you exactly what to do if you're listening. That's what I've seen with some of the businesses that I've been working with is they're bringing a lot of value, but it might not be to the right customer just yet, or they might not be to solve the right problem just yet, but they're close. You can feel it, but yeah, I think uh, you only fail if you give up. And it yeah. took us eight years to finally make you know something. So yeah, I think when I, I heard that 10-year claim before, and I hated it, and then I thought about it, and I was like, shit, it's <laughs> actually probably right. So it's that's the problem. Right. Yeah. Like a lot of those things, those sayings, they are, they are grounded in, in someone's yes. experience most of the time. Yes. Like I don't want it to take a decade, but anything good takes a while. It's like the time's in the past anyway. So might as well work on something you enjoy. Well, that certainly resonates. Well, amazing. I'll, uh, I'll close it out then with our, our traditional closing question, which is for hidden gems in the, in the area, something that other folks should know about that Maybe they do not. Mm. Well, you know, the fair amount, you know, back patio oh, is always, come on. always a great spot. <laughs> you're gonna no, take, you guys you're are going to pick this my, safe spot. <laughs> you're going to take my spot. Really? Are you yeah, kidding I, me? I knew, you only, I knew you only had one, yeah. so I might as well take that. But uh, <laughs> uh, the west side, Zinji, X-I-N-J-I. Oh, yeah, the noodle, the noodle oh, shop. Incredible. Very so good. good. I think a lot, of, a lot of the other ones are pretty, pretty well known, but... Yeah, I love those guys. Two blocks from my place. <laughs> Unbelievable. You pick my spot. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> well, give us something, Aaron. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to say that yeah, because I, I got nothing else besides my basement, <laughs> right, where, I, where, I'll, where I'll drink or have a beer or something, or like I'll go to the Fairmount, which is it's by Case Western. They have an incredible happy hour. They have... The bartender, the bartenders are great. The the music is phenomenal. They have two things on the menu, their happy hour menu that are phenomenal. It's um, they have these pot stickers that are really good, and they have their buffalo <laughs> tempura cauliflower. I think I'm pro- promoting them right now. But um, oh yeah, yeah you much guys are definitely out. not not spent a lot of time there. <laughs> no, like I think we were t- like that's where we're going <laughs> right after this, <laughs> right after this call. We're going to Fairmount, so. Yeah, it's been uh, they have awesome. a great patio too. Well, I'll give a I'll I'll prompt one because I'm just curious. What what would you call out in in Canton? Mm. Oh yeah, okay. There's I mean there's <laughs> if you've ever been to like like that like Belden Village, there's some solid spots. I mean, there's so many what, chain Apple restaurants. Bees? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, it's chain. We're just it chain the kingdom there. You got any? You got any else thing to say, Ja? Anything else? <laughs> no, there's a. Uh, <laughs> I'll give everyone. I'll give everyone an Eden Canton jam, okay? Tim's Tavern. All right, they got the best fish sandwich Ooh. you'll ever have in your life. They have cold beers. There we go. There like, we go. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, and there's, and there's a place. Like, there's the another bar. There's a bar in North Canton's Puckers. That's pretty pretty darn good as well. Perfect. Well, uh, we, we could we could wrap it there. I uh, I really appreciate both of you coming on to share your story and and reflections. Really fun to to hear. Likewise. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Yeah, Jeff, we appreciate it, man. Thank you. Absolutely. If uh, folks had anything they wanted to follow up about, where would be the best place for them to do so? For me, LinkedIn, for sure. LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm LinkedIn very active around. on LinkedIn. Perfect. Well, yeah. John, Aaron, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks. Talk to you soon. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. So if you have any feedback, please send over an email to jeffrey at layoftheland.fm or find us on Twitter at podlayoftheland or at sternhefe, J-E-F-E. 
If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please reach out as well and let us know. And if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or on your preferred podcast player. Your support goes a long way to help us spread the word and continue to bring the Cleveland founders and builders we love having on the show. We'll be back here next week at the same time to map more of the land. The Lay of the Land podcast was developed in collaboration with the Up Company LLC. At the time of this recording, unless otherwise indicated, we do not own equity or other financial interests in the company which appear on the show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of any entity which employs us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.